Okay. So. Okay, everyone, we should be live. I hit the button a minute ago, so we'll see. And Joanna should be telling me. Okay, so Louie, I'm going to ask you to stay off your phone and don't get on Facebook because the Wi-Fi speed here is so slow that we might not actually be able to stream if anyone, heaven forbid, yeah, gets on and looks at anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what? Look at that. Hey, buddy. Come on in. We started. We're live. So um, we're just going to jump right in, my man. Make yourself comfortable. Okay, so um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Bible study on the farm. So I know we are no longer on the farm, but I'm sticking with the name until I can think of something better. So uh, let's jump in with a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll dive right in. Okay. Oh, God, thank you just so much for having everything work out and come together at this last minute. Um, we just had so much to do today, such a busy day. Things were missing, things weren't turning on, <laughs> and I thank you for answering our prayers and making it all come together. And God, as we... Uh, as we start looking into the Bible, and, and specifically the topic of creation and evolution, I pray that you would, uh, you would encourage us, Lord. And, and more than anything, I always want all of us here and whoever's watching to hopefully just get a fire lit in them to want to read the Bible more and pray more and get closer to you. And, and God, we pray that you would show us what you want us to do with our lives for you. And help us just to have fun tonight, to learn something about the Bible, and, and hopefully be a little closer to you uh, tonight than we were yesterday. And, and we do love you greatly, and we ask your hand to bless and upon all we do and say, and in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so uh, for those of you who are new, which isn't many folks here, but maybe somebody uh, online, uh, we usually study the Bible through a book at a time and a verse at a time, and we went through the whole book of Genesis, and then we uh, took a break and kind of went over a couple different topics and had some fun, and then we switched venues. So tonight is the first night that we are <coughs> at Heart of Junction here in downtown Grand Junction, and um, we, we're going to take a break for a few more sessions, and we're going to go over the topic of creation versus evolution. And after that, we're probably going to jump back into the book of Exodus after we finish Genesis, and we'll go through the book of Exodus verse at a time just like we were before. So um, everyone, please feel free to stop me at any time, ask some questions. I do move quickly through the subject matter, and I don't want you to miss something because I didn't do a good job of explaining it. So just raise your hand at any time. And uh, I'd like to start out tonight with uh, exactly what I believe. I don't, wanna, I don't want anyone thinking I'm sneaking up on you. So uh, I believe uh, the Bible, and I believe it to be the complete and inerrant Word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for correction, sorry, for doctrine, reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So what I believe about the Bible is the Bible is not a book about God. I believe the Bible is a book written by God. And that is a very important distinction. Um, for me, I like to think that I have a good level of patience with new young Christians. I hope that I'm patient with folks that aren't believers, folks that don't read their Bible and go to church. But I do struggle um, being patient and understanding with the people that have gone to church all their life and just flat out don't believe what the book says. It's very hard to, to help someone if they're starting from the standpoint of, well, I don't really believe that what that book says. Well, I don't really have much more for you. I don't, I don't really know where to go uh, you know, with that one. All right, so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to go over the, the, well, for the next nine weeks, I think, we're going to go over creation versus evolution. Tonight, we're going to go over the idea of relevance. Does it matter 
if you believe in six literal days or six billion years. Does it matter? Are there consequences to what we believe? I certainly believe there are, but I want to start by just going over the two timelines so that we're all on the same page, we know what we're talking about here, and we can see just how vastly different the evolutionary timeline uh, is to the biblical creation timeline. So we start out, the evolutionary timeline really has <clears throat> four main events. The first main event is all the way to the left of the screen there. That is the Big Bang. And the last thing I read said the Big Bang happened 14 billion years ago. You'll read something tomorrow says it was 20 billion years ago. Both of those numbers are ridiculous as each other and any other number you come up with. <clears throat> Anything between 14 to 20 billion years, sure, put the number in there. It doesn't matter. It is nonsense, and we're going <clears> to <throat> we're going to prove that with empirical science in the next several weeks. After, <clears throat> oh, so here we go, the Big Bang. Now, keep in mind, this here is what uh, NASA believes and teaches. And I cited all of the sources here that, that I wrote down on these slides, so you can look them up later. And I'm going to have to turn around to read this one. Uh, when the universe began, it was just hot, tiny particles mixed with light and energy. As everything expanded and took up more space, it cooled down. We now know that the universe is 13.8 billion years old. That's amazing that they know that. Okay, after that, uh, 4.6 billion years ago, Earth forms. So remember, at the Big Bang, we just have uh, matter is created. We have hot gases shoot out. There was hydrogen, maybe some helium. And then roughly 13 to 4, uh, I'm sorry, 10 to 12 billion years later, four and a half billion years ago, Earth forms. And again, in between uh, these two events, the Big Bang and Earth forming, you got to remember you also have all the suns, the moons, the stars, the planets, uh, all through the universe. Those are all forming. And here again, uh, NASA tells us, <clears throat> when the solar system settled into its current layout about four and a half billion years ago, Earth formed when gravity pulled swirling gas and dust in to become the third planet from the sun. That's amazing, because it defies almost every one of Boyle's gas laws, but we're, not gonna, we're just going to hit that one and keep going. We'll talk about that later when we get into the astronomy in the Bible. But that's what your federal government believes. That's what NASA says happened, how the Earth came about. Then three and a half billion years ago, life appears. This one's my favorite. Now, this is from an earth science textbook. And I hate to say it, but this is what your kids are taught. If your kids go to public school, this is what they learn. It's written in public school textbooks everywhere. Millions of years of torrential rains created great oceans. Swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. It actually says that. Okay, so those are your tax dollars at work. Now, what's always amazing to me is this living organism that came from chemical soup not only came to life, but then it found something to eat, and then it found something to marry, and it figured out how to reproduce, and that's how life began. And then, about three million years ago, and these are rough numbers, man appears. And again, here we find that um, apes and monkeys uh, gave way to primates and eventually... Uh, split off and, and formed into humans. Now, you got to remember, whenever the science textbooks say millions of years ago or billions of years ago, what they really mean is we have no idea if or when this actually happened. So this is the, uh, this is the progression from life to uh, you have a single cell organism, multi-celled organism. You move up to slowly to a fish, to amphibian, to a reptile, to a mammal, and then to a monkey, and then to a man. Now, biblical creation teaches a different story. Uh, there's about four main events here as well that we're going to touch on. And it starts off with <coughs> supernatural creation in six literal days. And that happened about 4,000 B.C. Okay, So roughly 6,000 years ago, God created everything. Uh, when we say everything, God created the entire universe. Now, the word universe is two words, uni meaning single, and a verse is a spoken sentence. And that's what we find in the Bible. And God said, let there be light. And God said, let there be a firmament. And God said, see, God didn't create everything with a hammer and chisel. He just spoke, and things came into existence. Now, I'm often asked, Patrick, how do you know that the world is 6,000 years old? That's easy. The Bible tells us that. If we go through Genesis chapters 5, and I think it's chapters 11, we find the genealogies. 
So Adam lived 130 years and begot a son, Seth. And Seth lived so many years and begot Enos, and Enos, uh, Canaan, and Canaan, Mahaliel. Well, if you go down through the Bible and add up how old these guys were when they had their kids and how old they were when they had their kids, we find out that we have genealogies from Adam down to Noah, then from Noah to Abraham, Abraham to Moses, Moses to King David, King David to Jesus, and we all agree that Jesus was born roughly 2,000 years ago. Well, when you add up all those dates in the Bible, you come up with a number, and that number is about 6,000 years. Now, I am not one that is so dogmatic as to say that, you know, God created everything on October 5th at, you know, 6 in the evening. We do know that Adam uh, was created sometime in the afternoon because it was just before Eve. Other than that, we don't have real specifics as far as when, not one laugh, that's okay. Okay, <clears throat> Then what we have is the flood in the days of Noah. So that was about 2400 BC, uh, 4400 years ago. There was the flood in the days of Noah. And during that time, God had Noah and his wife and his three sons and their three wives build a boat, get on the boat, <clears throat> and then bring animals on the boat. God closed the door. He made it to rain for 40 days. And we read in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 6, I think that's where we are, uh, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. And in Genesis chapter 7, verse 11, we read all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were open. And that's what happened. The earth actually cracked up. The water that was under the crust of the earth came shooting out. Water rained down from heaven. All the mountains were covered. It was a worldwide catastrophe. Uh, that's why the top third of Mount Everest is limestone. It's covered in seashells. It's because it was underwater at one time. Uh, so anyway, we can read about the Genesis account in Genesis chapters uh, 6 through 9. And then in Genesis 7, 23, we read every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground. Noah only remained alive and they that were with him in the ark. So it's important to know that it was a worldwide catastrophe. It wasn't a local flood. It wasn't in one small part of the world. Every single person died other than the uh, eight that were on the boat. Then we come to the crucifixion of Christ, and that happens, uh, we all agree, uh, that happened when Jesus was about 33 years old. He was born uh, about 2019 years ago. And I say about, keep in mind, when we're adding up the dates in the Bible and those genealogies, we know that Adam lived 130 years and had Seth. Well, did Adam just turn 130, or was he just about to turn 131? So understand, there's variance of several months when we add up those dates in the Bible. There are times where God gives exact dates to the day, but that is not one of them when he's going over the genealogies. He wanted you to understand that it was in the 130th year of uh, Adam's life that he had his son, Seth. Okay, so we have the crucifixion of Christ, and the important thing we need to understand and take away from that is that we are sinners. We are on our way to hell. God wants us in heaven, and he made a way, and that's why he died on the cross. And the Bible says what we need to do in Romans ten thirteen: for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And my two favorite uh, words in uh, that verse are whosoever and shall. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. You don't have to hope you're saved or wonder if you're saved. If you call on Jesus to save you, you can know you are saved. Okay, and then we have present day, and it brings us down to the question, does it matter what we believe? Now, we just went a long way, and I didn't look at my notes once, so I don't have a clue where we are, so let me find it. Okay, here we go. So now what we're going to do is we're going to define the term evolution. So in any debate or any argument or any fight or whatever you want to call it, it's great to define your terms so we know what we're talking about. Now, you can define evolution however you want. I'm going to define it this way so when I say the term evolution, you know what I'm talking about. So when we look at evolution, we actually find there are six different types of evolution that we're going to go over. So the six kinds of evolution. Number one, we have cosmic evolution. That is the origin of time, space, and matter. And the evolutionary, or the evolutionist, uh, or the secular humanist uses the Big Bang. That's the typical model that they use as far as everything started at this point. 
Then, after that, you have chemical evolution. Now, this one's never talked about, but during the Big Bang, they say that hydrogen was released into the universe, maybe some helium, but that doesn't help. There are over a hundred, there's, I think there's 118 elements on the periodic table. Where did they all come from? Okay, They're, they came from somewhere. They had to evolve. How did that happen? Not only that, where did compounds come from? Do you know what compounds naturally do in the universe? They break down. That's what they do. They naturally break down. Okay, then after chemical evolution, then we have stellar and planetary evolution. So where did the stars, the sun, the moons, the planets, where did they all come from? How did they form? Okay, we have to be able to explain that. Then after that, then you have organic evolution. And this is the worst one. It's my favorite one to go over because it's the one the evolutionist has the fewest answers for. Where did life come from? Keep in mind, this was proven impossible by Louis Pasteur over 100 years ago with his law of biogenesis, but still they hold on to it. So life had to come from somewhere, and the evolutionists insist that life came from non-living material. We've never seen that happen, but that's what they have to believe. <clears throat> okay, then we get down to, in the, whoops, I hit the wrong button. There we go. In the field of biology, macroevolution. Now, this is the changing from one kind of an animal to another. And you'll notice I use the term kind, and the reason I do that is because that's the term that God uses many times during the book of Genesis. You will never find a dog produce anything but a dog, ever. Cats produce cats. That's it. Now, dogs produce different types of dogs. We all agree. Breeders do this all the time. They try to get big dogs and small dogs and fluffy dogs and dogs with black fur and blonde fur and whatever fur. That's fine, but they ne no matter how long you do this, a dog will always produce a dog. It'll never produce anything other than a dog. What we see in the world is microevolution, and that's variations within a kind. And genetics teaches us these lessons that contained in our DNA is a tremendous amount of information. And what you can see in two human beings in only you know, four or five generations is a tremendous amount of change. And human beings have brown hair and blonde hair and red hair and no hair, but they're all human beings. And you can get different types of people, but they're all people. People have never produced anything different. And the idea of macroevolution is the idea that the person and the dog and the cat and the banana, if you go back far enough, all share a common ancestor. And that's the difference. Now, these top five beliefs are religious. They are religious beliefs. They are not scientific. Yes, they use scientific terms all the time, but that doesn't make anything scientific. For those that might argue my point, let me explain. The scientific method. When scientists try to solve a problem they usually search for an answer in an orderly and systematic manner. This is the scientific method. We, anyone that enjoyed the sciences in third grade learned about this process. Well, one of the things required is experimentation. Well, let me ask you, how do you run an experiment on things that only happened millions or billions of years ago? You always ask the, the evolutionist, well, <clears throat> how do we how do we run an experiment on a bird and a tortoise having a common ancestor? You can't do that. It's impossible. The Big Bang was billions of years ago. And if you push it back far enough, it doesn't make it science. It makes it a fairy tale. Okay, science is testable, demonstrable, and you know what else it is? It's falsifiable. If it is not falsifiable, it falls outside of the realm of science. Falsifiability, the capacity for some proposition, statement, theory, or hypothesis to be proven wrong. It has to have a way to be proven wrong. Boyle's gas laws, Bernoulli's principles with fluids and air, those things are scientific laws because they were tested and every single time they yield the same result. So many times that we all agreed it's done. We are no longer testing it. We all agree it is a scientific law. Okay, that's the way it works. The inverse square law, the laws of thermodynamics. These are scientific laws based on experimentation, and there's a way to falsify them. You can run an experiment, and if they cease 
to show what the theory says, then we have to adjust or amend the theory. But this does not happen with evolution. They say, well, it can't happen now. It, it takes billions of years. Well, that's fine. But that's religion. Just because you write it down in a science textbook doesn't make it science. And if you cannot run an experiment, and if it is not falsifiable, it is outside of science. And that's fine. Here's the thing. You ready for this? Okay, this one always shocks every Christian I talk to. I'm not trying to get evolution out of the schools. I'm not. Teach as much evolution as you want. Stop teaching it in science class. That's all I'm asking you to do. Okay. Let's see, how do we falsify a Big Bang that the Earth forms or that life appears? As a matter of fact, the funniest one is that they've run so many experiments trying to produce life from non-living material. All they ever do is produce the chemicals of death. But still, it's in the science textbooks and they won't stop teaching it. Okay, so what we come down to here as far as creation and evolution is we really have a topic of origins. That's what we're top, talking about. Where did everything come from? Who made the stuff? How did we get what we have today? Okay, so let's go over some theories of origins. First off, we have Prometheus, the Titan. Anyone into Greek mythology? Okay, you're going to read it sometime. It's fascinating. Okay, so Prometheus formed man. He was the creator of man out of the clay of the ground. And if you want, and, and it's nonsense, and you can get into the rest of the story about Zeus getting mad and the punishment with the rock and, you know, Heracles freeing him and the whole thing. But would we agree that Prometheus is a theory of origins? Would we all agree? That's a story that someone came up with about how everything came here. Great. You can believe it, okay, but I, I personally don't. Then we have the Big Bang. That's another theory of origins. Where did all the stuff come from? How did it get here? Now, Bang is great if it's secular humans because it does it without God. No supernatural creative power. There's no power greater than you. Okay? So the Big Bang allows the secular humanist to have a creative arm. That's another theory of origin. No one knows. Yeah, where did the energy come from, right? What floated? And who made that? And who put the fuse? How did all the... Yeah, there's, no, there's, there's so many problems. Not to mention that it happened 14 billion years ago. Were you there and watching? I wasn't. Was there a documentary or a film or did anyone witness it? I mean, it and we can go over the idea <coughs> of why they think so and the idea that the universe is expanding and blah, blah, blah. I mean, we can go over all those things. It doesn't help at all. But, okay, let's keep going with these theories of origin. We have another one, biblical creation. The idea that there's a supernatural God and God created everything in six actual days. Now, is that scientific? No, it's not. It's a supernatural theory of origins. And there's nothing wrong with believing that. I'll admit that what I believe is not scientific. It's supernatural. It's outside of this universe. It's beyond our three dimensions and what we can prove scientifically. I have no problem stating that. That's why I don't, I don't push for biblical creationism to be taught in science class. It's not scientific. Okay, I got another topic of origins. Okay, this is one that I came up with. This is the rubber ducky theory. This is the idea that life came down to earth from outer space on the back of a giant duck. Okay, does that sound good? You know what? Let's throw them all together, teach the kids all of them in a philosophically neutral class that is not science class. Because all four of those are religious beliefs. All four. And that's all I'm asking for. Get it out of the science textbooks. Stop telling the kids you know. You don't know there was a Big Bang 14 billion years ago. Now, I haven't gotten much traction on my rubber ducky theory, <clears throat> but I think it has more, it's more plausible than the Big Bang because at least ducks fly. Okay. Let's see, George Wald. Now, I don't know if any of you know who George Wald is. Okay? George Wald was a professor of biology at Harvard University and won the Nobel Prize in 1967 for physiology. I want you to hear what George Wald said. 
When it comes to the origin of life, we have only two possibilities. As spontaneous generation arising to evolution, the other is supernatural creative act of God. There is no third possibility. Spontaneous generation was scientifically disproved a hundred years ago by Louis Pasteur. That leads us scientifically to only one possible conclusion, that life arose as a supernatural creative act of God. I will not accept that philosophically because I do not want to believe in God. Therefore, I choose to believe in that which I know is scientifically impossible. Spontaneous generation arising to evolution. So you can write me off and say that I'm crazy, but you'll also have a Harvard professor who is a Nobel laureate in physiology who agrees with me. Now, based on your theories <clears throat> of origins, you will hold to one of only two worldviews, the creationist worldview or the secular humanist worldview. You see, either God is the creator and therefore we answer to him, or man is God and answers to no one. See, if there's not a God that made us, well, raise your hand if you're the most highly evolved animal on the planet. See this? What are those? No, this one right here. Yeah, how do, but what type of thumb? It's a posable thumb. Ask a monkey to do this. They can't do it. Okay, we are the most highly evolved animal on the planet. So what does that make us? We're the God of this world. Now, secular humanism, it's a philosophy that embraces human reason, secular ethics, and philosophical naturalism while rejecting religious dogma and supernatural options as the basis of morality and decision making. So it says there is no such thing as religious dogma. There are no facts that we have to hold to as truth. Irrefutable facts. I believe that this thing is full of irrefutable truth. So if the secular humanist doesn't believe that there is any supernatural option for morality or decision making, well then, really what I always come down to is the question, how do you decide right and wrong? So there are several big questions. The three great questions in the world. Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going when I die? Well, if there is no God, then life is pointless. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. <clears throat> but if we're going to get right into the ugly stuff, it comes down to the question of right and wrong. See, Jesus said, or we should quote Matthew 22, verses 37 to 40, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. God gave us the Ten Commandments a lot longer than that. A bunch of rules, right and wrong. Thus saith the Lord. Do you know that God wrote down the Ten Commandments with his own finger written into tables of stone, two tables of testimony? Okay, God wrote it down. He didn't <laughs> make any mistakes. And in that, in the Ten Commandments, what did God say about how long it took him to make the world? He said, in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. When he talks about, uh, I think it, the third commandment is the, uh, I think is, uh, uh, keep holy the Sabbath, for the Lord made heaven and earth in six days. Or no, wait, is it the fourth? Ugh, don't even look. Okay, <clears throat> so that's what we have if we believe in God. Now, when you consider evolution on a moral and social level, it promotes only two things, and that's racism and genocide. I'm going to say that again. When you consider evolution on a moral or social level, it promotes only two things, racism and genocide. And I'd like to briefly cover the lives of two men on the screen. The one on the far left is Charles Darwin. A lot of us have seen that face. I would doubt that many people, other than one, know who Ernst Haeckel is. I believe that I can paint a picture that shows the beginning of the theory of evolution <clears throat> to its logical conclusion, the National Socialist Party and the elimination of over 11 million people. So let's start out looking at <clears throat> Charles Darwin, 
Charles Darwin. So Charles Darwin, for those of you who don't know who he is, Charles Darwin is known as the father of nonsense, or evolution, father of evolution. At the age of 22, he got aboard the HMS Beagle, and he made his way to the Galapagos Islands. He studied animals there for five weeks, got back on the boat, sailed away, and never returned. So Charles Darwin theorized that all plants and animals came from a common ancestor, and he was the first to come up with the branching pattern of evolutionary ancestry. Now, who knows what Charles Darwin is famous for? Say it again. Not the Darwin theory. What's the name of his book? The Origin of Species. Wrong. That's the title you and I know it by because the original title they would not let into schools anymore. The Origin of Species, right? That's what we're used to hearing. Anyone want to know the actual name of his first book? It was The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection <clears throat> or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Wait. What? Favored races? Who exactly are you talking about there, Charlie? So, <clears throat> Charles Darwin was a racist. I mean, a bad one. If you don't believe that, you have not read any of his books. In his second book, The Descent of Man, Charles Darwin... All he did was give justification for the racism that was prevalent worldwide. In The Descent of Man, we read, at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. And he had a great deal to say about the Irish. Man, he did not like the Irish. <clears throat> Now, what's funny is you never see this book in any public classroom because it would get torn apart for how horrifically racist this guy is. Now, if, <clears throat> let's see where we are. <laughs> now, how many teachers or college professors would keep their job after making statements like that one? Yeah, I would imagine probably not too many. Darwin admitted in his book that there was a great lack of evidence, but if his theory was true, surely a bunch of evidence would arise in the future. This brings us, oh, sorry, <clears throat> I don't know how I missed this one. Okay, here we see an advertisement for Negroes for sale. Now, when was this advertisement? It was written in 1859. When was The Origin of Species published? 1859. See, all his book did was justify the racism that was already worldwide. He gave scientific reasons for why it's okay to buy and sell certain people because they are not as evolved as you are. So therefore, you can treat them like animals because they're just barely human. So, whoops, here we go. Let me make sure I didn't miss one. So this brings us to Ernst Haeckel. Has anyone ever heard that name before? Yeah, you were the one I figured did. This man has affected your life more than most people you know. He has affected the world more than most people you know. Ernst Haeckel was a German zoologist at the University of Jena in Germany. He read Darwin's book in 1864, and he loved it. Now, because there was a great lack of evidence from fossils to help prove the origin of species and the theories it came up with, Dr. Haeckel came up with his own theories based on embryos. Has anyone ever seen the picture on the screen right now? 
It's in every high school and college textbook in America. The theory is ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. The idea is simple. Haeckel took eight embryos and studied them at different stages of development. He noticed that at the very early stages, you couldn't tell the difference between a fish, a salamander, a turtle, a chicken, a pig, a cow, a rabbit, and a human. He said they were just identical. It was only later on in the gestation period of the mother that they actually changed and looked more like the animals that were going to be born. He especially made no gill animals. And he said, these gill slits show the evolutionary process. And a human being actually goes through this process when it is conceived in the mother's womb. It starts out as a fish, then it transitions into more of an amphibian, then a reptile, then a mammal, and a monkey, and finally into a man. And you can see these stages in the embryos as they uh, progress. <clears throat> and he said it, it, it recapitulates what we see in evolution. The idea is that as an embryo develops, it goes through the adult stages of animals in the evolutionary process. Haeckel thought this was evidence of evolution and all animals sharing a common ancestor. Did I hit that one on the head? It's what he believes, it's what he taught, it's what's in the book. In 1866, he published his book, General Morphology, and started teaching his theories all over Germany. He continued touring Germany, teaching and writing books through the 1870s. In 1871, when Charles Darwin published his second book, The Descent of Man, he praised Ernst Haeckel. Now, <clears throat> Patrick, what's the problem? What's, what do you got against this guy? Well, the problem is he made it up. The drawings are all fake. He was tried and convicted of fraud by his own university, the University of Jena. But that didn't stop him from continuing to write many books, scientific papers, and illustrations, and those pictures that he faked are still in public school textbooks. You will find those in colleges and universities all over America. And that showed up in the U.S. Supreme Court in 1973 to give support for Roe versus Wade. That is what they used as their evidence that it is not a baby. Proven wrong over a hundred years ago. In 1904, he published his book, The Wonders of Life. He held <clears throat> that evolutionary biology had definitively proven that races were unequal in intelligence and ability and that their lives were also of unequal value. I read the book. The amazing thing about America today is that you can literally read any book. I don't care how many hundreds of years old it is, Google got a copy of it and scanned every page. You can sit on your computer and flip through any, pay, any book you want and read the whole thing. <clears throat> and in this book that Ernst Haeckel wrote, The Wonders of Life, it says the Australian Negroes are psychologically nearer to the mammals, apes or dogs, than to the civilized Europeans. We must therefore assign a totally different value to their lives. There was a genocide in Australia in 1876. All 6,000 aborigines on the island of Tasmania were killed. After that, they moved the genocide over to the mainland, started killing all of them that they could find. Again, this just shows us that the theory of evolution was used as justification for racism that already existed. That is why it was accepted around the world. 
So Ernst Haeckel starts writing books and touring Germany in 1866, teaching his racist propaganda, and by 1904, when he publishes The Wonders of Life, a young German boy is now 15 years old in public school. Adolf Hitler said, No more than nature desires the mating of weaker with stronger individuals, even less does she desire the blending of a higher with a lower race. To be clear, this is not the crazy theory of Patrick Hayes. You know who Stephen Gould is? Stephen Gould is an evolutionary biology professor at Harvard University. He said, Haeckel's evolutionary racism, his call to the German people for racial purity and unflinching devotion to a just state his belief that harsh, inexorable laws of evolution ruled human civilization and the nature alike, conferring upon favored races the right to dominate others, all contribute to the rise of Nazism. Now, anyone who is an evolutionary bi biologist knows who Stephen Jay Gould is. He is a hero. Now, he is not an evolutionary biologist anymore. He died. I think he died in 2002. He has been a young earth creationist for many years. So the Id ideology of the Nazis was based on social Darwinism. Adolf Hitler determined that the Jews were the lowest class of humans, equating them with apes and dogs. Hitler said... If I am ever really in power, the destruction of the Jews will be my first and most important job. As soon as I have power, I shall have gallows after gallows erected. Exactly the same procedure will be followed in other cities until Germany is cleansed of the last Jew. So you see, they believed in what they called racial hygiene. They wanted a pure human race. And they believed that the Aryans were the pure human race. So they practiced what were called eugenics. Eugenics is the science of improving a human population by controlled breeding to increase the occurrence of desirable hereditary characteristics. Now, the problem with this, and the question that's begging to be asked, is what do you do with the cow that no longer produces milk? Yeah, it's the next cow to become hamburger, right? It's no longer a value. It's only getting in the way. You don't want it anymore. And let's face it, <clears throat> it's an animal. That's what God said he put the animals here for. He said we're allowed to eat them. So, <clears throat> what if you change the law to say that Jews were no longer people? <clears throat> or gypsies? or the mentally and physically handicapped, or people with learning disabilities, or the Polish, or the Romanians, or Serbians, or the Armenians, or blacks, or the elderly. Because all of those were on a list that Adolf Hitler wrote up, and most of those he considered subhuman. He considered the Jews to be the lowest on the list and that they were almost entirely ape. So remember, all these people are just getting in the way of your pure-blooded Aryan race taking over the world. And if the evolutionary model is true and the strongest survive, the weaker must die off. That's how evolution happens. There's a beneficial mutation. There's an animal with some new characteristic that's just wonderful. And they need to thrive while all the other ones die off. Proverbs 29, verse 2 says, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. Now, what happens when you have the evolutionary thinking of Charles Darwin and Ernst Haeckel and Adolf Hitler, and you're in power? And just remember, Adolf Hitler was voted into power. And then an act passed where he no longer needed judges or Congress or anybody in creating new laws. 
He changed from chancellor of Germany to dictator. Well, what happened then? <coughs> in 1935, the, sorry, 1936, the German Supreme Court refused to recognize Jews living in Germany as people in the legal sense. They passed a law, and Jews now had the same standing as animals. What can you do with an animal? Well, you can round them up, and you can put them to work, and you can work them until they die. Do you know that America is no better? America, in 1973, the U.S. Supreme Court declared the word person as used in the 14th Amendment does not include the unborn. They passed a law. They said babies, before they are born, are not people. And remember what evidence they used to get that passed. Well, what can you do with it if it's not a person? Well, you can just kill it. It's not a person. It's an inconvenience. It's a mistake. That's all. Does anyone know who was the first victim of the Nazis? Who was the first person killed by the Nazis? You would think just some random Jewish person or Polish person, right? The first person killed by the Nazis was Gerard Kretschmar. Patient K. Gerard Kretschmar was a child. He was five months old. Gerard Kretschmar was born blind with only one arm and with either no legs or one leg. The original medical records are lost and the secondhand accounts vary somewhat. He was five months old when the doctors killed him. Now, at the time, euthanasia was against the law. So they had to ask special permission of the Chancellor of Germany to do this. And this is the letter Adolf Hitler wrote instituting the T4 program, allowing euthanasia to be carried out in hospitals on any children that did not fit the bill. Now, the transformation of physicians into killers took time and required the appearance of scientific justification. But soon after Gerard Kretschmar, the Nazis came to power. They had unlimited power. And the Bavarian Minister of Health proposed that psychopaths, the mentally retarded, and other inferior people be isolated and killed. A year later, authorities instructed mental institutions throughout the Reich to neglect their patients by withholding food and medical treatment. Pseudoscientific rationalizations for the killing of the unworthy were bolstered by economic considerations. According to the bureaucratic calculations, the state could put funds that went to the care of criminals and the insane to better use. Something that is never brought up in any books that you read about World War II, any books about the Nazis, what is never brought up is the fact that doctors were the ones who started the killing for the Nazi party. Not soldiers, doctors. And they would back up trucks to the hospital loading docks and they would wheel out people with disabilities people that were elderly, it just didn't make sense to take care of them anymore, they would wheel them out in wheelchairs into the gas trucks, close the door, the gas would run, they'd open the door, they'd wheel out the dead bodies, send them to the morgue. It was doctors and nurses that were doing that. Now, <clears throat> Adolf Eichmann, his assignment was to murder all the Jews in Europe. Adolf Eichmann's office was the headquarter for the implementation of what was called the Final Solution. The Final Solution, and I'm just going to kick this and keep going because we don't have time to get into it, but the Final Solution was a supernatural spiritual attack by the devil against the Jews. When Hitler and the Third Reich 
were losing. And their soldiers were retreating back to their capital. What do you do when your army is losing? In every war, all the time, you bring everybody back to defend the capital and try to mount a resistance. Adolf Hitler did not bring all of his soldiers back. Instead, he said, we are going to use all of our soldiers and all of our leftover resources for one thing, to kill every Jew. That was what Hitler did in the last days of the Third Reich. In August of 1944, the master of death, Adolf Eichmann, could report to Himmler that approximately 4 million Jews had died in the death camps and that another 2 million had been killed by mobile extermination units. In 11 years, the Nazis killed 6 million Jews along with 5 million others. The Gentiles included anyone, even children, who were mentally retarded, those with Down syndrome, physical handicaps, mental illness, gypsies, blacks, and the elderly. Adolf Eichmann, on December 2nd, 1961, was sentenced to death for crimes against the Jewish people and crimes against humanity. After living in Germany for a few years after the war, he realized what was coming and he fled to Argentina where he lived for many years. The nation of Israel had um, uh, uh, a mission to find every one of the Germans that were responsible for the death camps and the concentration camps and bring them to justice. They found Adolf Eichmann, they brought him to Israel, and they sentenced him to death. And on May 31st of 1962, the state of Israel carried out the only death sentence in its history on the man whose only defense through the whole trial was, I was just following orders. In the end, we have millions and millions of civilians dead, men, women, and children, and all because of a ridiculous idea, an idea that has never produced one helpful invention or procedure in the world. All evolution has ever done was justify hatred, racism, and massive amounts of killing and death. Now, because I don't want to end on such a down bummer of a note, I added one more thing we're going to cover, so bear with me. We have five minutes to the hour, and we might go over by just a couple, but we'll get this in quick. So, <clears throat> does it matter what we believe? Theistic evolution, is it possible? Nope. Not unless you are willing to ignore vast portions of the Bible. So, Theistic evolution is the idea that Christians came up with basically because they're cowards and they're not willing to say that the Bible's the Word of God and it's true and you're wrong. So instead what they do is they placate to the evolutionist who believes the world is millions and billions of years old and believes in pseudosciences and they don't want to look silly in front of their friends. So they say, well, the Bible's probably wrong about certain parts and maybe God used evolution and maybe evolution can work with the Bible. And I'm here to tell you tonight that you sound like an idiot. You sound like you've never read the Bible and you don't believe much of it. And I don't have a soft spot. And, I'm, and I understand that. And I really don't care anymore. I, out, out of all the people in the world who I don't have any patience for are the people that have gone to church their whole life and still don't believe the Bible. It's ridiculous. Okay. So let's look at theistic evolution. Some people think you only need to explain away the first chapter of Genesis and the rest is easy. I'm here to tell you that that's not even close. But before we get into the different theories, you have to answer one question for me. If you're the Christian who believes in theistic evolution, why? Why do you need to try and make a th the theory of evolution and the idea of an old earth fit into the Bible? Why do you need to do that? It's not the evidence. It's not evidence-driven. Anyone that says, oh, the evidence just points, oh, it's got old earth and evolution and it's all true. Or every debate I've ever been into, and I've been into tons of them, and I love doing them. I will, and just so we're clear, I will debate anyone at any time. If you set it up, you can get 10 scientists to debate me. I will do it all day long. It is shooting fish in a barrel. It is easy. 
I will go on TV and they will look stupid. And you might say, Patrick, that's arrogant. No, it's not. I have the truth. I read it. I know the truth. There is no evidence behind evolution. Every time I ask the same question, give me your top three. Just give me your top three. I don't need 100,000 facts. Give me, give me your top three, and we'll shoot those dead. Okay, it is easy to do. It is not evidence-driven if you believe in theistic evolution. The only true answer is outside pressure from friends and family and popular culture trying to satisfy two conflicting groups. You want to believe the Bible, but you don't want to be laughed at by a peer group. I get it. I understand why people do it, but stop telling me that it's the evidence. It is not. So what you come down to is you really have one major theory that you can land on if you want to believe that the Bible allows for millions and billions of years and the theory of evolution to be true, and that is the day-age theory. The idea that the days of Genesis chapter 1 were not 24-hour days like we experience today, but rather long periods of time, maybe millions or billions of years. So let's look at the problems with the day-age theory. Okay, uh, number one. Um, it's not what the Bible says. There's the first problem. It doesn't say millions or billions of years. It says that it was a day. If God wanted, he could have used the term millions or billions. Do you know that both of those terms are found in the Bible? Millions and billions when talking about time. But he didn't do that. He said day. In Genesis 24, 6, he uses the number billion. In Daniel 7, 10, he uses million and 100 million. And in Revelation 9, 16, he uses 200 million. God understands those large numbers, and he uses them in the Bible when they're needed. But he didn't do that. He said he made everything in a day. And then day number 2, and 3, 4, 5, 6, and rested on day 7. Okay, number 2, it was physically impossible. Those days could not be millions or billions of years. They had to be actual literal days. On day 1, God made the heaven, the earth, and light. On day 2, he made the firmament. On day 3, he made plants. On day 4, he made the sun, moon, stars, and planets. Now, how do the plants on day 3 survive till the sun is created on day 4 if those days are not actual days but millions or billions of years? Yeah. Day five is created by animals that fly and swim. How are plants pollinated for millions of years without animals? 75% of all plants on earth, flowering, vegetable, and fruit, require animals for pollination. They would die if animals were not here. Okay, so if those days were millions and billions of years, how did those plants survive? Okay, next problem with the day-age theory. <clears throat> the word day means just what it says. How do you get the evening and the morning out of a million years or a billion years? Okay, the word day is used with the number 359 times in the Old Testament. God gave us parameters by defining the word day with the evening and the morning. You don't get an evening and the morning of a billion or million years. Okay, the word day plus a number, the word uh, evening and morning, uh, Oops, sorry, there it is. <clears throat> you also have night and day. You have evening and morning with the word day, evening and morning without the word day, the word day with a number. All of these terms, every single time in the Bible, they only mean one thing, and that is a day. Okay, now I'm just going to say this, okay? Um, I don't speak Hebrew. I don't. I'm not even trying. I don't care to. Okay, why would I? Got the Bible's in English. I don't need to. Okay, but this guy does. And let's see what this gentleman says. This is Professor James Barr, professor of Hebrew at the University of Oxford. Probably so far as I know, there is no professor of Hebrew or Old Testament at any world-class university who dares not believe that the writers of Genesis 1-11 to intended to convey to their readers the idea that the creation took place in a series of six days which are the same as the days of 24 hours we now experience. Every single professor of Hebrew around the world that he knows of, none of them would say that the uh, author of Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3 think that the word day means anything but an actual, literal, 24-hour day, just like we believe. Okay, finally, Exodus 31, verses 17 and 18. Uh, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, 
and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And he gave on to Moses when he had uh, made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. So when God, who didn't write much of the Bible physically, as far as I know, this is the only part. Now there might be more, I don't remember, God wrote it all through people. Don't get me wrong. I believe God wrote every line. But as far as him physically taking a piece of stone and writing it out with his finger and carving it into stone, it happened once. And that's it. When he said, I made everything in six days. Conclusion. And we're going to wrap it up. If we don't believe the first chapter of the Bible, why would we believe the rest of the book? There is no way to reconcile that the earth is old or that the theory of evolution is true. There is no way to do it scripturally. There is no way to do it scientifically. And over the next several weeks as we meet, We will go over the age of the earth. We will go over organic evolution and spontaneous generation, dinosaurs in the Bible, the flood in the days of Noah, astronomy in the Bible. We will go over all of them. And God designed not only the world, not only our solar system, but the universe to show that it was specially created by God. There is no other explanation for it. With that, you guys have been wonderful. We are done I will stick around for questions if anyone has any. Yes. So the stone tablets were the first text messages that God gave to the Israelites. And then Moses got so mad when he came down with them that he smashed them to bits. And then what did Moses do with the bits of stone from the Ten Commandments from the two tablets? Nope. Wash, what did Moses do? When he broke the Ten Commandments into pieces, what did they do? They picked up the pieces, and what did they do with them? They put them in the Ark of the Covenant. Very good. And you'll read about that later. Okay, but that's what they did. They saved those broken pieces of the Ten Commandments. That's good. Yes, question. No, no you are not, because out of all the things that they made in the temple, some of which you can see, the one thing that they hid was the Ark of the Covenant. During the Babylonian captivity of the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, laid siege to the nation of Israel, uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar took away all of the implements that they had for the temple. He had the the laver and the basin and the candlesticks and all the different stuff. He took away the one thing that's lacking in that list was the Ark of the Covenant. And it is believed that the Jews knew, because they were under siege, that they were going to lose and that they were going to be taken away and they would never allow the Ark of the Covenant to fall into the hands of their enemies. So it is believed that it is hidden. And we can go over the different places they think that it might be, but that's certainly a... um, uh, a discussion for another time. I can tell you one place it is not. It is not in a secret uh, American military underground compound put there by Indiana Jones okay, uh, back in the 30s. Uh, that is one place I know it is not, but that's it. Good question. Any other questions? Okay, you guys are the best. Let's get out of here, and uh, we'll meet back in two weeks. Two weeks, tell your friends, okay? Let's fill this place up, get some more people here for creation versus evolution. We'll do it for uh, another several weeks. Okay, I'm going to go to the back and turn off the camera. Then I'll...